Welcome to the Bruce Point Set Show, the world's most dangerous infomercial. Along with my producer, Ado, we bring you this bi-weekly news, commentary, and interview experience from the Numbers FM studio at the Portland Art Museum. You can catch the full show every second and fourth Wednesday at CM on the Numbers FM 96.7. And you can catch clips on youtube.com slash Bruce Point Set, as well as exclusive bonus content on patreon.com slash Bruce Point Set. Right now, we're live on Twitch. You can follow the numbers on Twitch at twitch.tv slash the numbers FM. That's numbers with a Z. But we begin each show with news stories you might have missed, but should be on your radar. So now without further new or without further ado, the news. Our first story comes from Lamet Week. It's by Sophie Peel. It's titled Charter Reform Measure Will Appear as One Question on November Ballot After Judge Rules in Favor of City. According to Peel, the Monday ruling by Judge Stephen Bouchong means that naysayers of the reform measure, who almost all take issue with the bundling of all three major reforms into a single ballot question, have no recourse left to challenge the measure. The Portland Business Alliance filed a lawsuit against the city over the ballot question last month, asserting it violated an Oregon law that requires ballot measures must only contain one subject. Bouchong heard oral arguments by opposing lawyers on Friday. The three reforms in the measure included ranked choice voting, expanding the city council to 12 members elected from four geographic districts, and adopting a city administrator form of government that would scrap the city's current commission style of government, a model no other city in the U.S. still uses and is widely seen as ineffectual. It's now likely the political action committees that have formed on either side of the issue will kick into high gear. Two PACs, one led by City Commissioner Mingus Maps and the other by a group of one-time staffers for late Mayor Bud Clark, are attempting to critique or kill the ballot measure. Community groups, including the Portland League of Women Voters and the North Star Civic Action Center, led by Building Power for Communities of Color, are running a pro-charter reform campaign. The BPCC Coalition has raised over $200,000 so far. So we've been keeping track of the charter reform that now all three measures are officially going to the ballot in November. But to reiterate, this is an opportunity for Portland to change its style of government to something you know, more modern and hopefully more equitable for the entire city. So we'll see how things go in November and be on the lookout because we might also have some content on this show, specifically with charter reform members coming in the future. Our next story comes from the Portland Mercury. It's how Q&A, an expert on right-wing extremism and the outcome of Patriot Prayer criminal cases by Alex Zelensky. So according to Zelensky, after sparring with a group of anti-fascists outside Cider Riot, six of the Patriot Prayer affiliated men involved were arrested on charges ranging from assault to riot. Three of those accepted a plea deal with Multnomah County District Attorney's Office, admitting their guilt for their crimes. Two, including the leader of Patriot Prayer, Joey Gibson, had their charges acquitted by a judge, and a jury found the remaining activist, a man named Mackenzie Lewis, guilty on riot charges. Lewis faces three days in jail for his conviction. The largest sentence in the group went to Ian Kramer, who struck a woman with a baton so forcefully during the May brawl that she was knocked unconscious and sustained a vertebrae fracture. The result of a plea deal put him behind bars for 20 months. To understand that outcome of these, uh, or to understand the impact of these outcomes, Willamette, or I'm sorry, Portland Mercury spoke with Stephen Spigot, an analyst of the Western State Center. So according to Spigot, in Portland, it's important to explore the full range of options. We need to see responses from multiple different city entities, not just the district's attorney's office. There are civil actions cities can take. We saw that happen in Charlottesville. Civil suits are a great tool in responding to political violence. Spigot also says, one thing that's often overlooked, especially in a place like Portland, is the proximity to a state border. You have people coming in from Washington and other states with weapons seeking to participate in violence, which is a federal crime. Local and state governments should be asking the federal government to intervene. The Western State Center wrote a letter encouraging the U.S. Department of Justice to investigate Patriot Front after their members were arrested by local law enforcement in, Cor 
and Cora de Alene. So fortunately this is, you know, disappointing news for a lot of people, but white justice at work where even if a guy, you know, knocks a woman unconscious with a baton, they're going to give him 20 months. And we've seen Patriot Prayer out here terrorizing the city, continuing a very deliberate campaign. And the justice system is doing what it does. It's funny, uh, you have people cosplaying this idea as if they're being the victims, yet somehow you have the same judge, jury, and executioner dynamics. So we can hope for better, but continue preparing for the worst. Next story comes from the Oregonian. It's titled, Chip Industry Supplier Plans Major Vancouver Expansion Project Super X by Mike Rogaway. Rogaway writes, SEH America may add 300,000 square foot feet to a silicon water or wafer factory in Northeast Vancouver, expanding its capacity to help address the global ship shor chip shortage that is stifling production of everything from autos to appliances. The CHIPS Act, signed last week by President Joe Biden, provides $280 billion in subsidies and tax incentives to boost the domestic semiconductor industry and prevent future shortages. SEH says Vancouver expansion will position the company to capitalize on new factories being built across the country. Project Super X could increase SEH's Vancouver footprint by nearly a third, according to the planning documents. SEH is already among Clark County's largest employers with about 850 workers, according to the Columbia River Economic Development Council. Further, Rogway writes, and SEH hasn't committed to its Vancouver expansion. It's merely begun the permitting process. The company contemplated a massive expansion in East Vancouver in 2009, but abandoned those plans five years later. The Portland area has one of the nation's densest concentrations of semiconductor production, with Intel, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, Onsemi, Microchip Technologies, Corvo, and analog devices operating large factories on each side of the Columbia River. In Oregon's chip industry, or in Oregon, the chip industry added about 4,000 jobs last year. That pushed the state's technology workforce to a new peak as manufacturers juice production to meet unprecedented demand. But the region is poised to miss out on the chip industry building boom underway in other parts of the country. So CHIPS Act has been big news. Job creation is always big news. And we'll see what happens with this uh, factory in Vancouver. Again, this has been proposed before and has also been nixed before. But when we look at why people, you know, move to the state or move out of the state, oftentimes, again, it comes down to jobs, job opportunities. So however you may feel about it, looking at this semiconductor industry and the opportunities that are coming is important just from a state or from a perspective of making sure you're paying attention to the economy. So we'll continue to stay tuned. And our final story comes from OPB. It's titled Police. Portland area crime ring trafficked 44,000 stolen catalytic converters, 14 indicted. It's by Jeff Thompson. Thompson writes, Beaverton police say they arrested the leader of a crime ring that's responsible for trafficking more than 44,000 stolen catalytic converters since January 2021. Detectives say they identified 32-year-old Brennan Patrick Doyle as the leader of the operation in March. They say they searched his waterfront Lake Oswego home last week along with seven other properties and seized more than 3,000 catalytic converters. Doyle and his associates are accused of an organized effort to steal catalytic converters from vehicles up and down the West Coast. The crime ring was centered in the Portland metro area, but reached as far as New York and Texas, according to Beaverton police spokesperson, Matt Henderson. So I'm not going to lie to you. This is my favorite story of the week because for years now, <laughs> we've been talking about car theft in Portland and the narrative has basically just been let's scapegoat, ho or let's scapegoat houseless people. It, it must be them. And it turns out it's being run by a guy in my hometown of Lake Oswego, Oregon. 
the wealthy suburbs and Beaverton police. Let me add again, Beaverton police did the search of this man's waterfront LO home, <laughs> which, you know, as a person who has had some, uh, some thoughts about LO police that I've shared in the past, I, I thought that one police were very, you know, territorial about their spaces and they are nowhere to be found in these stories, which is weird, but whatever. But again, We've been talking about this. Oh my goodness. The houseless must be, you know, taking all the car parts. We don't know what's happening. And it's a crime ring led by a Lego Swigo guy. Like a guy who I could have went to high. He's 32. I'm 33. We could have went to high school together. It is, it is so emblematic of this moment in time. And again, it is just a, so many levels of delicious irony. And that's the news. The Bruce Points That Show will be back after this quick commercial break. The Bruce Points That Show is made possible by the support of members at patreon.com slash Bruce Points That. Patreon is a service that allows you to directly support creators like myself through monthly or annual memberships. Become a member for as little as $3 a month and get access to exclusive bonus clips and live discussions. Check out this clip from the page. Are you defending the prequels? Where where does your defense end, Bruce? Ah, <laughs> so, you know what? Maybe this might surprise you, but yeah, I, the whole meal deal. I will defend I will defend the prequels kind of. Again, I also had a disclaimer at the beginning that <laughs> I would not put money on me if I were betting on this as a viewer, but Will I defend the prequels? Yes. I... If you enjoy this content and believe in the community I'm trying to build, please support by becoming a member at patreon.com slash Bruce Poinsett. Welcome back to the Bruce Poinsett Show. It's everyone's favorite segment, the mail report. Yeah. This week, we, we had to do a little, switch it up a little bit. This is going to be a little, uh, I'm going to call it Hellman's Most Wanted because there is a lot of uh, white justice news in the news. <laughs> so we're going to start, you know, Ada, we, we, enjoy, we enjoy the nerd things just we do. a little bit. Mm -hmm. And there's this movie that the WB is still putting out, mm -hmm. The Flash, starring one Ezra Miller. Yep. Ha have you been keeping up with, Ezra's, Ezra's, uh, escapades. Yeah. Escapades. That's a, it's a good word. Uh, sadly I have been keeping up. It's a mess. <laughs> yeah. So for those who, those who don't know, Ezra Miller, uh, the flash <laughs> star of the flash. Yes. Has been on a, an epic Epic run. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember it was like, it was like two years ago when they put out a video, some random video threatening like a North Carolina chapter of the KKK. And we're just like, I mean, I guess that's a net positive, but also <laughs> this is bizarre. <laughs> and then there were some things before that, but things started like cascading, uh, you know, they were accused of grooming. Uh huh. And then that escalated to uh, kidnapping in uh -huh. Vermont, including uh, yeah, kidnapping a mother and their child. The child was found in one case with a picture with a, a bullet mm. in her hair, I want to say. You know, normal things. Yes. And mm. then, then Ezra was on the run, like literally. On the, on the run, run from the law. Yes. <laughs> but no, never fear. The Flash is still, you know, <laughs> WB has decided they canceling a whole bunch of things. Yes. Like Batwoman movie. Uh-huh. Uh, Scoob for all you Scooby-Doo fans Sorry, out there. Sorry, Scooby-Doo fans. But The Flash. is still going. Yep. And 
don't don't worry if you're like but wait what what about ezra where are, what don't they have to be there mm-hmm. well variety has reported that ezra is seeking treatment has released an apology aka the wb threatened ezra <laughs> <laughs> allegedly <laughs> to get some help because we gotta put this movie out uh-huh but it is <laughs> it has been a mess because like i feel like from what you just described like i remember hearing about this like in march and like they were beating people up in hawaii um yeah it's been a mess oh god that's right i yes. forgot about that video of yeah they just beat up a random woman and like a I don't know, it looked like a target. Yep. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> they they have been like regularly violent. They have been kidnapping. Like it's been it's been a tale for sure. But that flash movie is yep. still coming out, people. So don't you worry. Yes, we are still getting the flash film and Batwoman helmed by uh multiple people of color has been canceled. Woohoo! Been canceled. But it will go down as a tax write-off from the WB. Right. Ooh. It was going to be released on HBO Max, too, like, exclusively, and they still canceled it. So I'm just kind of like, okay, okay. Shout out The Flash, though. It's still coming out. Mm, 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 mm. So uh, let's take it up a notch, though. Next level. The entertainment world. Let's go to not not news. Um I don't know. What, what, what do we call Alex Jones? Uh, conspiracy. Tyrant, uh, maybe, in some places. Yeah, that's all, all those words. Uh, yeah, for those who don't know, Alex Jones, a uh, big media conspiracy theorist. You know, I first found out about him, I think, in college. I, they're like a bunch of... Uh, he was like based in Austin, Texas, mm-hmm. and he kind of like got his got his start there. Came up as just kind of part of the oh yeah, Austin's weird, you know, vibe. Yeah, right. And I remember seeing like things like Patrice O'Neill and some other comedians I was a fan of mm-hmm. like went on his show back in the day. But it's basically just like you know, he's the conspiracy guy. Yeah. Also, you know huge pusher of boner pills mm-hmm. like making millions and millions and millions off of boner pills mm-hmm. but I digress he I remember the point where at least like I didn't follow Alex Jones closely but where I was just like oh that's what this guy's about is like right after you know protests started building up around the Trayvon Martin case mm. I remember he, he did this like video seemingly from like his bathroom where he was claiming that Trayvon Martin was a hoax. Mm. And it's just like, oh, this isn't just like this isn't just your you know run of the mill conspiracy theory. He's flipping the script and making it. He's appealing just to you know make this a vehicle for the white supremacists. This yes, is, this is oh that's what this is uh-huh. wonderful. But don't worry, he's a equal opportunity offender you know he's said the frogs yep. are making people gay that was a famous one yeah but most recently he was lost a lawsuit with the parents of sandy hook because for years oh, he's yeah. been claiming that that too that school shooting of elementary school students teachers was a hoax oh, that my- the oh children who died were, and the parents are paid actors. Oh my and God. And it was all a scheme to take your guns. And he's just been claiming that and doubling down on that for years and years. And finally, he lost the lawsuit. And for the people wondering, so what does that mean? I think the number was something like at first, for one family, it was like four mil and compensatory damages i want to say and then 45 million in punitive damages and this is just Mm. one of uh i want to say there's gonna be at least a couple more cases one would hope even more after that but we'll see agreed and one would look and say okay 45 million dollars plus another four mil plus god knows how much 
that's going to stop him, right? Mm-hmm. No. Oh. So throughout this entire case, he's still been going on his show, still smearing the families, smearing the judge mm. during this lawsuit. And to top it all off, I guess there's a law in Texas that uh, limits punitive damages to 750 or 750,000 mm-hmm. per person. So that 45 mil, not going to be 45 mil. Uh, and guess what's probably going to cover all those costs? All those boner pills that mm-hmm. he sells to his angry white male audience. So if you're thinking, are we finally done with Alex Jones? Probably not. No, he's going to keep going. And Definitely. this may further embolden him. Mm-hmm. Yay. Speaking of which, that brings us to the the cream of the mayonnated crop. Mm-hmm. One Donald Trump. Mm. We've we all have seen that his Mar-a-Lago resort was raided by the FBI and among other things, he's, you know, being investigated for violating the Espionage Act, Mm. which in the past has mostly been used to, you know, prosecute and go after whistleblowers exposing, you know, government corruption, uh, human rights violations. But so, you know, the Espionage Act is an interesting thing in itself, but that's another discussion. Mm -hmm. But there's just a a magical irony here. (laughs) Yeah. Where the same guy who, you know, was doing lock her up chants for Hillary Clinton and arguably Hillary Clinton lost the 2016 election over emails. Mm -hmm. In this case, you have Donald Trump who kept uh, not just classified government documents, but they're saying that includes nuclear documents, possibly. Whoa. Nu- like nuclear, not like nuclear energy, like nuclear weapons. Oh. Now, I, if I'm comparing emails that, you know, we're saying, well, Hillary Clinton should have been, should have been more careful to wrongfully taking nuclear weapons documents that there's an investigation of whether he was trying to sell them oh. to foreign entities. No. Now, which, I'm not sure. Hey, though, you tell me. Which one sounds worse to you? Hey, man, look. Those nuclear documents? Like, huh? The fact that he was given the access to those in the first place is ridiculous. But the fact that he was able to take them home. Yeah. How? 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 <laughs> like, just, just what? <laughs> oh. Like, a few things, you know, I'm not surprised by a lot, but they just let him just, just walk out with the nuclear documents after January 6th, after, <laughs> <laughs> after an attempted coup. I, I don't know how that, that works. And similar to Alex Jones, you might be thinking, so this is the moment, right? This is the one. This has got to be the thing that finally puts, you know, puts a stop to this charade. Like, Trump can't run for president anymore. We're going we're gonna to cut this off. People are going to distance themselves from him, right? No. Uh. <laughs> of course not. He is made uh it's been a fundraising boon including at least a couple of days so far where he's raised a million in a day because of the fbi raid excuse me and now a new the new favorite chant of trump his cronies all these uh right-wing zealots is defund the fbi <laughs> Just, (laughs) uh, it's, it's, um, I would say it's dumbfounding, but I have learned that the, 
the formula is just what is the outrageous thing that's probably where it's going just Oof. assume assume it's going to keep escalating so you have people like marjorie green who uh you know the georgia congress person clown is literally sen- selling defund the fbi merch it is a rallying cry we've ridiculous. had attacks a guy a guy who was at the January 6th coup when I want to say Cincinnati to like the Cincinnati FBI office with like actual like an AR-15 and a nail gun started with the nail gun which is an interesting choice mm-hmm. but attack the FBI office there's been all kinds of threats to the FBI wow I heard a statement earlier on the radio Mike Pence had to come out and make a public statement saying that trying to tamp people down say we can't keep saying defund the FBI we're no worse than the people saying defund the police Mm -hmm. and it is it is amazing it is amazing and apparently none of this disqualifies Trump again from running for office in 2024 that is wild yeah it (laughs) so Get ready for that, everyone. What if it comes out that he's guilty? It's looking like he's guilty. So, like, what if the info comes out that he is? I predict he will raise even more money. Although, <sighs> there is one, one, uh, one negative, I guess, for Trump. Mm. As I was uh, getting the stuff ready for the Hellman's Most Wanted today and looking up Alex Jones and the latest. It turns out, because another thing that boosted Trump in his election and since has been, you know, Alex Jones' love for him. Mm -hmm. But apparently, according to the Daily Beast, Alex Jones dumps Trump for Ron DeSantis, who is, quote, way better. So a lot of things are going well for Trump, but apparently he is lost to another uh, Mail uh, Report-focused person. Uh Uh-huh. He's lost Alex Jones' support in favor of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. So, yeah. Yo. For those wondering, uh, what's to come again for the election? You've got one fascist or another fascist it's on the GOP side. Yay. Oh, my God. 2024 is going to be a mess. Yes. <laughs> yes it is and yeah in another world some of these things might I don't know disqualify these people from everything might put right. them in you know I don't know jail mm-hmm. but again tell them most wanted is white justice everyone yep and that's the mail report <laughs> The Bruce Pointstead Show will be back after this quick ad break. BrucePointstead.com is your one-stop shop for everything Bruce Pointstead. You have my services such as freelance writing and editing, creative nonfiction courses, as well as customized writing classes, event facilitation, and digital content creation. Again, go to BrucePointstead.com for a quote and make sure to sign up for our newsletter so you don't miss any news or updates. Welcome back to the Bruce Pointstead Show. Got a special guest with us today, calling in from Ashland, Oregon, uh, Gina Duquesne. Gina, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, all things considering, um, you know, politically and personally, life is good. Um, so, yeah, doing good. Yeah. So, for those who may not be familiar, Gina sits on the Ashland City Council. And actually the first black city councilor in Ashland history, if I'm correct. <laughs> you know, elected in unfortunately. You were elected in 2020, I believe. Yeah. Uh, actually our first interview did last year for the Black Tastic Adventure series. It was kind of like coming right. I think you'd been in office for only like a few months at that point. So, you know, I just wanted to want to just check in, you know, because I know one of the 
a theme I've noticed with a lot of people, especially like, uh, you know, historic first in a lot of parts of Oregon is talking about how, you know, there's a lot of momentum in the campaign and like right afterwards, but, you know, I've heard a lot of people kind of lament about sort of like how the support goes away. And especially with, uh, you know, a lot of people, I'm not gonna say storming city council meetings, but definitely uh, focusing and targeting city council meetings for things, whether it be critical race theory, you know, anti-trans bills, anti-mask bills, et cetera, et cetera. So one has, I'm curious if, you know, Ashlyn has been experiencing that and two, just how, how you would assess sort of like, has the support maintained, has that energy maintained or where do you think it's at? Well, um, that first off, Bruce, great questions. Um, because, you know, I believe Ashlyn is ready for a change. Um, that's how come I was elected. Um, I believe that's why our mayor was elected is because Ashlyn is sick and tired. And if we are who we say we are, then let's walk the walk and talk the talk. I want to be held accountable and I will hold others accountable also. When I first was elected, um, the thrill was there. You know, you have your honeymoon season and life is good. And then reality sits in. I'm in my sophomore year now. I feel very um, stable and more sure-footed in my position on council. And so I've never been one to have a problem to say how I feel about a subject or a matter. I am not a person who will tolerate or accept injustice by anyone or anything. And I will say that. Um, so now it's kind of like, you know, people look out, here I am. And I am not um, unapologetically black, queer and me. And I will always have the voice for the people of Ashland. Um, I ran on Gina for the people, and that's who I am. And I am not talking about the people in the hills or the people with all the money or the people that go, come and go, but for the people of Ashland in the browning of America, because we are everywhere. And if Ashland is this accepting community, then be who we say we are. Mm. And, you know, Ashlyn kind of has a reputation as sort of like the more liberal pocket of that sort of Southern Oregon area. But I am curious as far as just uh, like, what kind of pushback have you received, you know, as you've kind of like grown into this position? Like you said, you're in your sophomore year. Yes. Um, something that when I think of Southern Oregon and I think of, um, Grants Pass, I think of Klamath Falls, I think of Medford. Um, I would much rather be in Ashland than be in any other areas of Southern Oregon. And I think something that we've touched on before, there's areas in Southern Oregon, there's areas in Oregon that I just, I won't go because I don't feel safe. And um, as a black person, in um, Oregon, especially in Southern Oregon, there's no anonymity. We stand out. And so there's certain areas that I will not, will not, you will never see me there. Um, and when I think about um, the racism that is systemic throughout Oregon, throughout the West Coast, the United States, um, Sometimes people will come and they will say, you know, Ashlyn is this and that, and it's racist and it's terrible. And it's, yeah, I, I'd rather be here than a lot of other places. However, we do have a long way to go. And that's why I am grateful that I'm in my position so that we can have that conversation. And I am all about educating people who don't look like me and have the real conversation about critical race theory. And what does that mean? And are we influencing anyone by this? Well, I certainly hope so. And I am about the education of individuals so that um, 
we can be mindful of others because you don't know what you don't know. And when people sit down and have a conversation about race, about our cultures, about true American history, because black history is American history. And let's put it all on the table. And let's talk about what happened to the indigenous people, the Chinese people, the Japanese people, our people who were brought here, not because we wanted to be here. I want to have a full open conversation about American history. So it would be safe to say, so people have been coming and organizing and coming to the city council meetings about that then. People have been coming, um, not necessarily to city council meetings, but as individual, I mean, as me as an individual, mm -hmm. people have come to me, uh, black and white people, you know, the black folks, you know, we're so how, where are we going to stand on this and where are we taking this and, and, and what direction are we moving in? One thing I will say about Ashland City Council is we put a social equity and racial justice commission in place. This commission works as an advisory uh, body to council. And what I am so grateful for this is that the people on this commission are people of color because I can't do it all by myself, right? We need right. a community of people and, and different uh, opinions, lived experiences and thoughts. So I really appreciate this commission. And one of the things that, well, actually the first thing that they brought to council was that um, we need to have a DEI manager, not a DEI manager, but a DEI person in city hall because everything trickles down from the top. So how can City Hall, how can the city go out and do something or say something if we don't have our own house clean? So this is something I'm very proud of, of this commission and this body. Um, that's what the first thing that they brought to council. And so it was like, well, we're not budgeted for it. What are we gonna do? And by putting our heads together and going into this new biennium, it allows us an opportunity to look at the budget and see how we can budget for this much needed position. And so it can trickle down from the top. Right, right. And, you know, again, like up here in Portland, we always, you know, get all the stories down from there. But I know one that definitely, you know, got, you know, uh, definitely uh, inspired a lot of emotion in people was uh, the killing of Aiden Ellison. And, you know, I was, you know, in preparation for this interview, I was just kind of like looking up uh, some updates on that. I think there was a FBI hate crime awareness campaign that I want to say was recently launched. Uh, yeah, but can you just talk about uh, what's been happening with that case? If there are any new, you know, updates for people? You know, Bruce, that was a very sad day. That just blew me away. And I think it brought a lot of reality to people who live in Ashland and in Southern Oregon. Yes, it does happen. Yes, it can happen right here in your backyard. Oh, uh, sorry. Let me, I don't mean to cut you off. But I should give context. I know some people might be watching this and not know what we're referencing. So I should say Aiden Ellison was a young, I believe 19 year old, I wanna say, 19 year old, yeah, 19 year old black child <laughs> and was killed by a white man for basically loud music. Or so is the, you know, that person's justification, they so say. So yeah, I just wanted to make sure I give that context for those watching, sorry for, Interrupting. Thank you. No, thank you, Bruce, for, for shedding some light on that and understanding. And when I would hear people say a black man, he was a 19 year old child. He was not uh, a man. A man, a white man came out and shot and killed him because he said his music was too loud. 
And I, and to me, the man, Aiden was outside in the parking lot in his car playing his music. The man came out and asked him or told him to turn his music down. Words were exchanged. This man went back into the hotel, grabbed his gun, walked down the hallway, opened the door, went out in the parking lot and shot and killed Aiden Ellison. To me, that is premeditated. You had the wherewithal to think, I'm gonna go back in my hotel room and get this gun and come out and kill this, this person. That to me is true. It, for me, it's clearly premeditated murder. And it's a sad thing because he was here. Um, his mom said that he felt safe in Ashland and this is what happens. And it was in November, right before Thanksgiving. Uh, that September, we had the Alameda fires down here that I'm sure you probably mm -hmm. heard of in Portland area. And um, we had a lot of displaced people because of that fire. And that's the only reason why these two individuals were staying at the Stratford Inn. And I am really disappointed in the Stratford Inn because when Aiden's mom came to Ashland to get her child's remains, her child's body, she said she wanted to stay at the place where her son last ha had his last breath. And they charged her $200 plus dollars a night to stay at this hotel. I thought that was terrible. That was unforgivable. This happened two years ago. Do they have any kind of plaque or memorial or anything about Aiden's death in the parking lot in the hotel? Nothing. Once again, let's just act as if and sweep it under, under the carpet. No, that's never going to happen. The students of Ashland High School took it upon themselves to paint a mural of people of color on the wall at their school in dedication to Aiden and other people of color in the community who have given back. I am honored that, that I get to be there too. And by the students taking the initiative to do this and go to council and go to public art commission and get this done and raise the money on their own I applaud them and more power to them to bring the awareness that Aiden was murdered. And the year of his anniversary of his death, that's when the mural was done and, 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 and unveiled to the community. And Aiden's mom was here once again. I will not forget, and I will not let Ashlyn forget what happened and how it happened. And right now the man who murdered Aiden is still sitting in jail. There has not been a trial with a conviction as of yet. And for me that, you know, Aiden's mom lost her son, he'll never come back. And this man sits in prison, not convicted of anything. They were talking about a hate crime. I talked to our police chief about it. And uh, he said, you know, I wasn't there. We don't know what happened. So we can't say it was a hate crime. This man came out of his room, asked Aiden to turn his music down. They exchange words. He walks back into his room and gets his gun and comes out. He has the wherewithal to think about what he's doing. And this is not considered a hate crime or a premeditated murder. That doesn't make sense to me. So I will question that and I will never forget Aiden and the city of Ashland is never going to forget Aiden for a couple of things because of what happened. The mural is there. Also the public's art commission and a wonderful young black artist named, what is his name? I think his name is Micah. And um, 
he is putting together a beautiful uh, monument that is this beautiful sculpture that will be hopefully in Railroad Park very soon, uh, right here in Ashland, that will commemorate the life and celebrate Aiden. And yeah, you you mentioned earlier just even the reason that that family was there was partially just like displacement from the Alameda fires, and it feels like it's just like this uh, confluence of various issues that I think the region is facing. I was looking at a to make a hard pivot here, but uh, I was looking at a map or a story I want to say from. Uh, yeah, I was on OPB talking about, you know, wildfire prevention for this year. And I believe Ashland is in like the one of the probably worst spaces in terms of just like vulnerability. And this idea that, you know, when I think about, you know, when I think about that murder and the chilling effect of, you know, when people are already dealing with, again, possibly losing their homes or at least being even just being temporarily displaced and people are dealing with, you know, dealing with natural disasters. You're dealing with, <laughs> you're just trying to survive and you have someone doing, you know, just the, you know, literally sending that chilling message of, yeah, you're still not, we might kill you here. <laughs> and, you know, Bruce, this was so, I, I felt this was such, um, it's a terrible situation when 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 fires happen. It's a bad thing. You, you know, we lose lives, homes, businesses, um, and so many people in Ashland and in Talent and in Phoenix and in Medford were coming together to help each other. And and really, I was starting instead of hearing that division of oh, I live in Talent, oh, I live in Ashland, oh, I live in Medford. It was more of the Rogue Valley, the Rogue Valley were really coming together and I saw humanity in action. And then this man takes Aiden's life. So all of that goodness dissipated because of this one man's action. And for him to be sitting in prison for two years I mean, in jail for two years without a conviction, it just doesn't seem right to me. I feel like, you know, a family, you can't get closure once a, a family member's gone, and especially taken in this manner. But how do you really find any type of movement if this guy's just hanging out in jail and meanwhile, her child's been gone for two years? And I, I really, um, I feel as if there needs to be action taken in more of a, a progressive way so that at least there can be some type of justice for Aiden and the story can go on because the story will go on. The story will live through his siblings, his, his, his parent, his mom, and through the residents of Ashland. After Aiden was murdered in Railroad Park, um, there was a fence that was put the uh, was put up. There, a fence was always there in Railroad Park. However, on this fence, residents of Ashland took the initiative to take white T-shirts and write the names of black people who have been murdered on these white T-shirts and they started to put it on the fence. It started with Aiden. Now that fence is covered with t-shirts wow. of people who have been murdered. And that is sad. That is sad. People would ask me, so Gina, how does this make you feel? How does it make me feel? I take excuse me, but I take this shit personally. You know what I mean? I have a black son. I have two black grandsons. I am a black mother and grandmother. I take it personally. 
So is it ever going to end? Is it ever going to be quiet? Is it ever going to be swept under the rug? Not as long as there's wind in my body. And, you know, again, uh, a little bit of a pivot from that. It's just a, I mean, it's just a tough story. But, you know, we talk about, it's like, how would you assess that momentum or lack thereof in town when it comes to, I, I think a lot of people have been kind of noticing, especially since, you know, if the crescendo or whatever was at, you know, 2020, that feels like there's a lot of, uh, I guess that desire, especially amongst like most of the, like white spaces to like keep sort of these DEI efforts, these sort of, uh, you know, supporting culturally specific things. Like I know it's like a lot of uh, waning, <laughs> waning energies that, do you feel like that's kind of been the case too, especially when you talk about, you know, coming off something like Aiden Nelson's murder and something so, you know, tragic and right in front of people? Um, I think that some very well-meaning white people, you know, some people, I think we need to, it, it's interesting because I really, I feel as if some people will flog themselves because of what their ancestors did. I don't expect you to flog yourself. You don't have to beat up yourself. I do want everyone to be accountable. I do want people to educate themselves. I do some, some well-meaning white people come across and they're just so, oh, Gina, blah, 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 blah. And, and the microaggressions are just feuding and they have no idea what they're saying or what they're not saying and how it affects people. And I think, is it waning? I think that it sometimes it is, but what I see here in Ashland is some people try to take it to another level, but it's not what you do, it's how you do it. You know, I don't expect you to flog yourself I do expect you to educate yourself. I do expect that um, through conversation and education, we can find common ground. People will say a lot of times, oh, so we can get over this. No, we're never gonna get over this. I, I don't even like when people tell me that because racism is too systemic for us to just, okay, we're done. I, I, I don't ever see that happening. What I want is an understanding of what has happened so that we can find common ground and be able to live together successfully. I am all about unification. I am all about inclusion. However, and that means inclusion of everybody. And I do feel as if, if we're gonna have common ground we have to work together and we have to be allies because if black folks could have stopped racism, we would have done it a long time ago. It's gotta be a two way street. So um, I think that it, I, I feel as if we need to continue the conversation and we need to do it the right way. So many times I've had, um, being on council sometimes, you know, people, this, this is interesting. When I first got on council and I would say something or ask a question, the white folks would look at me because we're all on Zoom, right? Mm -hmm. And they look at me like, hmm. And I would just kind of tap, tap, are you there? Am I frozen? Give me an answer, man. Say something, right? It, that would just blow me away. And now, uh, we're in person, but before we got off of Zoom, even the mayor stood up for me and she said, uh, so did you guys hear Gina's question? It, you know, people will look over you if you don't make enough noise and let yourself be seen and heard. And that's what I'm doing down here in Ashland is I wanna be seen and heard. I wanna carry Aiden's family's message 
I want to be able to open the door and have conversations and bring more people who look like us to the table. Yeah, Ashland City Councilor Gina Duquesne, thank you again for taking the time today. Thank you, thank you so much, Bruce. Anytime, anytime. And this has been the Bruce Poinsett Show. Make sure to catch us every second and fourth Wednesday at 7 p.m. on the Numbers FM, as well as on youtube.com slash Bruce Poinsett. And for exclusive clips, go to patreon.com slash Bruce Poinsett and become a member. In the meantime, Hey, Black people, trust me, it won't hurt. See you next week.